I'm uh, Alex Minetto. I'm from the Department of Electronics and Telecommunications, as probably all of you. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are here to attend my presentation because I know that the most of you are from biomedical, uh, biomedical topics, let's say. But anyway, uh, I would spend some words, uh, differently from the previous speaker, about the PhD. That's why the, the title of navigating a PhD, what, what, what it meant to me and uh, what, what's going on in my PhD. In the meantime, I will spend some words on results and achievements that I, I got with all the team, our research group, during my PhD. So squeezing the last drop of information from the Global Navigation Satellite Systems, it seems something really theoretical, because it is actually a bit theoretical, and is related to information theory, partially. But I will keep the math really, really quick. And uh, this is a brief summary of um, my academic life, let's say. So after the telecommunication engineering master degree, I moved uh, for the last six months to UMATSAT, which is a European organization for the exploitation of meteorological satellites in Germany, Darmstadt. Then I started working for a small company for one year. Then I switched to the PhD because I don't like to work so much. <laughs> no, that's not the reason, of course, but it's uh, really um, much more motivating to attend a PhD than, uh, th than working for, for this specific company. Not, nothing against this company, absolutely. But it's uh, very m more challenging and more interesting to, to do the PhD, up to now at least. And uh, I'm part now of the NAVSAS research group, which is a joint team between uh, Politecnico and Lynx Foundation, which is a, a company, let's say. It, it was the, um, I mean, it's the old Istituto Superiore Mario Boella, that probably someone of you knows, is there, uh, close to the, the Mensa, the canteen. And um, all the people involved are both from Politecnico and from uh, Lynx Foundation, as I told you. And we are all involved in a lot of international projects. Uh, and as you see, uh, there is a map here because many of uh, colleagues of mine have been almost uh, wherever in the world. Someone that is already, I mean, that is here in this room uh, have been also in Antarctica. I was so lucky to be in the, uh, close to the North Pole and someone is now in Brazil to taking some data collection for a specific purpose I will tell you after. Uh, someone else in Australia and, and every, everywhere. A lot of industry collaborations also are going on uh, with some relevant companies in mainly global navigation satellite systems. The research areas of the NAVSAS are, um, I mean, spreaded among uh, all the different topics uh, related to navigation satellite systems and are related mainly to the receiver design, sensor integration, jamming, spoofing, space weather also. I was also lucky to work uh, with some colleagues uh, about space weather. Signal authentication and last but not least, because it's my topic, <laughs> is uh, the cooperative positioning, which is fairly new, but it's uh, a challenging topic and uh, I spent almost uh, three years of my PhD working on, uh, on this topic. Just as a quick overview of the, what is Global Navigation Satellite Systems, the usual acronyms that you find is GNSS, which stays for Global Navigation Satellite Systems, but there are not only Global Navigation Satellite Systems, there are also some regional systems. And uh, the most famous is, of course, GPS, because it's the oldest one in principle. But we have now the Galileo, which is, Galileo, sorry, which is operational, and uh, GLONASS, uh, another system from uh, Russia, and Beidou from China, also known as COMPASS. And other regional systems are uh, NAVIC and QZSS, that are from, uh, respectively from uh, India and Japan. And which is the difference between uh, global and regional, the terms are, are enough to explain, I guess, but global, it means that there's a global coverage, so satellites are used for uh, positioning purposes uh, all over the world, while the regional one, if you see the distance of the orbits, actually, the average altitude from the surface of the Earth, is a uh, fair higher than the previous one. They employ mainly geostationary satellites that are orbiting far away from, uh, from the other ones, and they are focusing a specific region of the Earth, since they are moving, actually, uh, with the Earth rotation. And this is a, a brief overview and I will spend some words also to the problem of the positioning, of the radio positioning. 
It's the same for any kind of radio positioning systems, but it's, uh, it holds also for, uh, for satellite navigation systems. So basically, what we need to understand, what we need to compute, is our position in an absolute way, in a given reference frame, in uh, any kind of point on the Earth's surface. Not only on the Earth's surface, also in the sky, because uh, planes also need for computing their own position. Not that easy to compute something, let's say, below the sea or below the, the ground, because uh, you cannot, I mean, get the, s the signals from the satellites. That's, in principle, it's quite simple and trivial. And the idea to retrieve our position is to compute our coordinates, so x, y, z, which is something that everybody can understand. Now we, we live in a three-dimensional system, so actually x, y, z. But there's another uh, unknown in this, in this problem, which is the time of our receivers. So we are receiving signals that are transmitting from satellites with a given time reference on board. They have precise atomic clock on board, and we have not so precise and not atomic at all clock in the smartphone, for instance. And um, given that it's not precise at all and uh, it's not even a good clock, uh, the, the, the big problem, the big issue about the clock is that it's not aligned with the clock in orbit. So in the end, the other unknown you find here, this delta B Genesis N, is uh, the difference of our time with respect to the one in orbit which is coordinated among all the satellites of a given constellation. For instance, take GPS as an example. Our smartphone is, uh, could be two days uh, ahead with respect to the clock, because you switch it on and uh, the clock is wrong, or whatever kind of, uh, of, of issue you have on, uh, on your receiver. The smartphone is just a, a, an example of possible Genesis receiver. What we need to compute our position is a simple system of equations that everybody can easily understand here, at least here, and uh, is, a, um, is a system of equations that are actually ranges. Ranges from a given reference position. As you saw from the previous slide, the satellites are our known position, and we can compute the distance just by measuring the time we receive the signal, I mean, the time of flight of the signal, so the time that the signal takes to reach our receiver from the satellite. And the key point is that if we could get ideal measurements, we have a, a so precise, I just moved now, okay, the, the, um, the orange point you see at the intersection of the different uh, circles that in three dimensional uh, space are spheres actually, is a, a very precise positioning solution. But since we are not so precise in measuring the distance from the satellites, we have still to determine, so to, we have to be computed this uh, x, y, and z, and b unknown, but we have no precise solution, uh, sorry, precise measurements from the satellites. And this problem is due to this other additional uh, element in the equation, so the source of error. This is a huge topic, and there are many sources of error for our measurements from the satellites. I don't have time to explain, but you can take any kind of reference to, to understand this. Just think that instead of having, sorry, instead of having these uh, very, very precise circles you have here, you have something which is uh, slightly blurred. And so instead of a precise point, you get a cloud of points. And this is the main issue of uh, positioning in global navigation satellite systems, in radio positioning in general. Instead of having this uh, precise point positioning, which is also the name of a technique which aims to, I mean, at reaching exactly this kind of precise point, you have the nominal GNSS positioning, which is a cloud of point, which is distributed with a given uh, uncertainty that could reach tens of meters. This is just an example, 15 meters, and according to my colleagues there is even a, a good solution. And um, there are two main issues regarding these. One is the relative geometry of the satellites you can see. So actually where they are in the sky when you get your position. And the other one is the quality of the range measurements that you are retrieving from that signals. What's the point of this uh, hard theory? No, not that hard, quite simple instead. But uh, precision and accuracy. I don't know how many of you already faced this kind of, uh, of ambiguity. Because uh, 
uh, you can find on Wikipedia a very good explanation of this. But the problem is when you apply this kind of concept uh, in reality. So th the best situation we can have is high accuracy and high precision, and is uh, obviously the, the goal of the positioning in general. But sometimes we can have some other different, com different combinations of the accuracy and precision. And let's say that the quality of our, uh, of our estimation could be very dangerous if we are trying to drive our cars just by knowing, let's say, some autonomous car just by using GNSS. That's why GNSS is w only one technology used in autonomous driving. And uh, other sensors, like IMU, for instance, are used to, to navigate for them. Um, try to think that if you have high accuracy and low precision, you cannot say with a, an eye let's say, probability that you are specifically in uh, one of the points of the cloud in the circle of the first image and probably you are colliding with another car or you are not. You don't know because you cannot state anything about your true position. You just have the estimation from the satellites. And now I'm going to talk about my topic. <laughs> uh, what's the idea behind the cooperative positioning? Let's try to understand that in uh, urban environments, you can have different quality in your estimation, in the, in the quality of uh, your positioning estimations. You see here a map of uh, some streets crossing where uh, some uh, green dots indicate, uh, indicate uh, good uh, positioning solutions, while with the scale, this uh, qualitative scale on the, on the left side, uh, you have some red dots with a very bad solutions. In principle, we want to exploit some data that you can get from the cooperation among the receivers in order to improve the positioning of the bad quality receivers, let's say, uh, by exploiting the good positioning of the good quality receivers. And this is done, for instance, by exchanging the pseudo-range measurements, by combining them with the proper mathematical methods, and to get this distance I called D and M, depending on the, I mean, you can have the green uh, agent that are actually aiding agents and you have the target agent that you want to aid with this information which is the red one moving somewhere else uh, with respect to the, to the agent. There are several things that you can do with sensors but if you cannot see, for instance, you have a ultra wideband and a LiDAR and a lot of sensors that you can use to do this kind of, 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 uh, of approach but they are limited by the line of sight. If I can see the other car, I can use the sensors. But if I can't, I can't sense the distance between the two cars, of course. By exploiting the networks, so network communications, uh, we can exchange this data and compute the distance between the, the vehicles, for instance, without the need of line of sight, for instance. What's the measurement outside this estimation? This is the behavior of an experimental, uh, of a simulated with realistic signals. Uh, experiment and you can see that the accuracy of the range measurements among the receivers is quite high taking into account that you are obtaining it through satellites measurements. So you have an uncertainty of about 5 meters which is a 3 sigma uh, error let's say and is uh, quite low if you think that you are just mixing information coming from satellites so you have a higher center uncertainty tip typically on uh, what we call pseudo ranges from satellites and you get this kind of accurate measurements. The um, technique, this one you can see in the plot, exploit all the shareable satellites. So if I see five satellites, the other agent can see the same five, we can mix information and we can retrieve this distance. Which is an additional distance but for uh, the one of you that who knows uh, the meaning of a correlated information, you know that this information is correlated with the information I already using for retrieving my own position. And this is the main issue of the cooperative positioning, correlating, correlated information that I try to add to other information I already have. To clarify this point, I come back just to the theory to say that this new distance we have, we want to add it at the system of the set of equations we had before, just to give the, the most of the information we can, adding this new line of the equation. There are two issues by adding the equation like this. The first is that the new reference location 
is nothing than is, is completely different from the location of the satellites we can download from the network actually is an estimated position of the other user who is helping you and the other point is that the new range as I told you can be correlated highly or poorly correlated with the information that you used to retrieve it and uh, what's the effect of integrating this new range in your positioning computation this is a theoretical result and is regarding uh, um, actually the precision so it's just the uncertainty of your position running a lot of Monte Carlo simulation this is the reference trajectory we used and we used the green dot as a uh, aiding agent in the middle of the of the left uh, lobe of this uh, of this Bernoullian, uh, Bernoullian uh, trajectory as you see sometimes the integration is beneficial for your positioning sometimes it's not and you see from this uh, synthetic uh, plot here that sometimes you get a non-profitable integration so it's better to rely on satellites and sometimes you get some profitable integration the most of the time in this case and so it means that the collaborative computation it helps to reduce the uncertainty of the retrieved position we did some uh, realistic experiments that are not actually real because we are not using a real receiver but we are generating satellite signals in the laboratory and we tried first with this a simple circle with here you can see just the two agents cooperating but with more than two up to ten and we had a look on the effect of the position estimation if you see in the A area you slightly see that the yellow points that are obtained from the hybrid so the cooperative algorithm are uh, a little bit thick, um, thinner than the blue ones and we see from the results actually that there is an improvement an average improvement if we see the percentiles uh, of the cumulative density function uh, that means that we have some beneficial approach also for realist uh, some beneficial uh, some advantages in using cooperative positioning also in an experimental uh, environment not only from theoretical point of view there's a, a big issue in uh, estimating uh, I mean you, you can estimate just the accuracy when you are in a real environment because you are, have not the chance to perform several Monte Carlo simulation because satellites in the meantime are moving so you are changing completely the conditions of your experiment and so you need to measure at least your uh, accuracy and if you see if you pay attention to the numbers there uh, we save almost uh, one meter in average of accuracy which is quite a lot because it, it's almost the 11 percent of, uh, of, of improvement actually and this is the simplest approach for positioning because it's a least mean square algorithm which is a, a basic algorithm for positioning if we switch to a, an extended Kalman filter that is uh, quite close to the one that a colleague explained before uh, if we integrate this new measurement even if it's partially correlated we get uh, a fairly higher uh, improvement and you see that the, the overall mean bias here the dynamics is quite complex because the speed is increasing also in the experiment before but even if uh, uh, we can I mean consider some uh, very complex dynamics we have uh, a 21 percent of improvement in using cooperation so that's uh, the main motivation that is I mean the, the reason that is motivating the, the research effort in this direction and you see that with respect to the previous plot on the percentiles of the cumulative density function we have a, a major improvement in uh, our hybrid solution integrating cooperative measurements and uh, if you want to I mean know something more these are the published works they are not all related to the cooperative positioning there's something also related to the um, uh, space weather uh, so there are some works also with the other colleagues and uh, also on uh, smartphones measurements because now you have a GNSS receiver here uh, many GNSS receivers actually and uh, we are studying also the effects of uh, I mean the, the, the quality of, the, of their measurements and uh, further works we have, s we have some pending papers just to let you know that we are waiting uh, 155 days for the aerospace transaction so <laughs> it's pending from uh, since a while and uh, other uh, transactions are also waiting and we are also running a project 
about a real implementation on uh, Android uh, operating systems of this kind of cooperative uh, strategy and is uh, running by, I mean, uh, by a, a company and is a project uh, uh, funded by European Space Agency. So we are working on, uh, on this side also. And some uh, awards I was lucky, since I'm almost uh, not at the end, actually I need to write my, my master thesis and you know very well wh what it means, but um, I was lucky to, I mean, to earn some awards uh, about, the, about my, my work in uh, cooperative positioning, uh, mainly. And the last one, which is not, not, not officially yet, is the student paper award at the um, main conference in navigation. So uh, I, I think that other people working in the community understood <laughs> almost the idea behind. So I hope also you understood uh, uh, my, my speech uh, today. And I, I'm particularly, uh, I mean, I, I love this, uh, this picture because uh, uh, the, the left half is from Antarctica, which is a place uh, Nicola visited for his uh, research topic, uh, which was at the time uh, scintillations measured by, um, sorry, atmospheric scintillations uh, measured by GNSS signals. And the other one is the North Pole, or I mean the closest point to the North Pole I, uh, where I, I've been for uh, two weeks uh, during the summer school of the European Space Agency. And I also had the, the, the chance to, to take measurements also from that place. They look very similar, not, not from the color because there's ice some in the south and uh, there's no ice in the north, but they are so far away from each other and in the end they were uh, similarly, let's say, proficuous in terms of, uh, of research and, uh, and, uh, and papers as well. So thank you for your attention and uh, if you have questions, I'm glad to answer.